Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining from the four corners of the earth. So um, I'm going to talk today about these two things. This particular one, Witchcraft of Tomorrow by Doreen Valiente, I've, I've had for some considerable time. Uh, let's put it like that. This is a version of Liber Null and Psychonaut by Peter J. Carroll, uh, which is a more recent acquisition, but somewhere lurking around. I think there is an earlier version of the text. So I'm just going to um, share my screen with the fabulous people. We're gonna, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, something like this. Um, and then obviously we'll have an opportunity for some uh, questions. So hopefully everyone can see that successfully. Marco, give me the thumbs up if that's all good. That's all good. Fantastic. So Light on the Shadows, Doreen Valiente, Chaos, Magic and 21st Century Witchcraft. I mean, this particular talk has quite a kind of personal resonance for me because I, I guess I describe myself and I'm often described as a chaos magician. But my uh, induction into the world of uh, collective ceremonial magic uh, and uh, esoteric practice really came from or oh, through Wicca. Uh, initially through the Alexandrian and then later from the, through the Gardnerian streams of the craft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship of these texts. But before I do that, we need to kind of set this into a bit of a broader kind of uh, context. So let's begin by thinking about, oh, 1978. There we are. Boom. There it was with... Um, uh, what have we got here? Kenny Rogers, we've got Garfield, we've got Greece, we have Lego, space uh, astronauts and so on. This is the year in which both Lieber Null in its first iteration by Peter J. Carroll and um, Witchcraft for Tomorrow by Doreen Valiente are published. So both books have remained in print for the last 44 years, which is no mean feat really for any kind of publication. So to contextualize this, we have to think about the time in which these books are being written. And if we just focus for a moment on the year of 1978, we can think about, OK, so what's what's going on in culture when people write stuff about magic? There's sometimes um, uh, a sense that they are writing, you know, the the um, the secret store, secret knowledge of the universe and that it is timeless in some sense and that it is always true um, uh, or that it is starting to it's trying to ar articulate a perennial wisdom now that may be true in some respects it's also the case that anything we do sits within a kind of historical context so 1978 let's have a look at 1978 these two books are published these are the uh, the current uh, editions. In fact, Liberdal and Psychonaut by Peter J. Carroll has just been republished with a forward by Roald Hutton. So we can see immediately a whole series of interesting strands weaving themselves together. Pete uh, Carroll these days, uh, his primary practice is actually druidry. Uh, so that's a thing. Um, and Witchcraft for Tomorrow has gone through lots of different covers. Um, but it still remains one of those books that you see recommended. When people ask me, you know, for a good, a decent book on witchcraft, I say, well, actually, as long as you remember the historical context of what's going on, Witchcraft Tomorrow for me by Dorian Valiente is an excellent, excellent text for a number of reasons, which we'll unpack as we go through today. 78. So what happened in 1978? All kinds of things were happening in 1978. So in some respects, in culture, as we get towards that kind of the latter part of the 20th century, but we get to a lot of things that we recognise. So 1978 is the first appearance of the rainbow flag. So the flag for LGBTQ plus questioning, queer identified gay people, that flag has its first outing, which I suppose is an appropriate term, in 1978. So this is a very interesting thing because, of course, um, you know, if you think about something like the, how radical social changes happen, um, male homosexuality in, in Britain was decriminalised in 1967. That's the year before I was born, 1968. So we're talking about a time of radical change. 
in many respects, one might argue that all times are perhaps times of radical change. But in 78, we can see a change with sexual identity, which is really, really important that overturns a whole series of historical and cultural, um, let's call them prejudices in this context that have existed for a very long time. Popular culture. Um, this gentleman over on the top right hand side that you can see is Sid Vicious, the, uh, the bass player with uh, a band called the Sex Pistols. So they actually broke up in 1978 after a rather ill-fated tour, I think, of the United States, if I remember correctly. So punk is happening. What's punk about? Well, punk is partly about um, a rebellion against authority and established order. That's definitely part of the story. And in doing so, part of what this rebellion, uh, how this rebellion is kind of structured, is it's structured around the idea of what be becomes known eventually as DIY culture, do-it-yourself culture. Do something yourself. Don't wait to become part of, um, uh, you know, if you want to be a musician, for instance, get a guitar, try having go. So there's a sense in which uh, punk represents uh, a, a sense of um, empowerment and a sense of people being able to, um, being encouraged to be active creators of culture. So there are, of course, innumerable punk clubs and bands and magazines and so forth that emerge <coughs> over this period of time. Now, what also gives people a sense of power and agency in this period, <coughs> excuse me, is that we have the development of the personal computer. And this is um, an Apple II. I think that's actually probably released a year or so before 78, the Apple IIe, which was the first computer that I ever set eyes on and got a chance to play with, came out, I think, in that year. So the Apple computer, microcomputing, this was one of those, those um, changes within culture that, again, allowed there to be uh, a technology which enabled people to develop a whole suite of different ways of interacting, um, I was trained as a graphic designer back in the 80s, and I was training it with a, a thing called desktop publishing, DTP as it was called. And that was a, an ability that we had now to publish materials very, very quickly, very easily to typeset stuff on a computer. You know, it's often, I think, living in this environment, having the conversation in the way that we're having it now, we forget about these things. We forget about how significant and important these changes are within uh, our society. So personal computing starts to really happen. The other thing that happens is um, crisis to do with energy. Um, and uh, this is forever topical as we really get towards the end of the 20th century and onwards, and indeed uh, very relevant to us today. So we have an energy crisis. Suddenly, the things we thought we could rely on, which was essentially a notion that oil was magically infinite in some way, comes to a crashing halt. We have big petroleum shortages, elevated prices. We've got big crisis in 1973, big one in 1979. There's a whole series of wars unfolding. There's the Iranian revolution and the supply lines to what is now clearly a bigger global market and an interdependent set of economies are shaken in a way that hadn't really happened very dramatically and, and, uh, uh, in this sort of period post World War Two, so there's also a kind of a sense of uncertainty in a way when we look at 1978. So we have radical cultural changes that are, are, that are unfolding in the very in the personal sphere of sexuality and gender identity. We have a rebellious culture that seeks to destabilize the previous order and encourage people to become uh, creators rather than only consumers. We have technological developments that allow things like primarily enhanced communication to take place. And we have a sense of the unnerving nature of the global world that we live in and the precarious situation in which we find ourselves with regard to our resources. So that's what's kind of going on at that period. And that's the time in which these books are written. But in order to understand these books, we have to wind back a little bit further and we have to go back really to Oh, let's say definitely a kind of a uh, hundred years to keep it simple. And what we have to think about is we have to think about uh, romanticism. 
So much of the magical revival that happens in the latter part of the 20th century owes its, has its roots in the Romantic movement. So the Romantic movement is a artistic, it's a literary movement, it's an intellectual movement, it happens in Europe and it happens actually towards the end of the 18th century. But it's one of the changes in the way that the, the um, that people are starting to understand the world that really sets up the conditions for the later on emergence of, uh, of magic in the way that we kind of understand it now. So this is an idea, romanticism, which is about um, an emphasis on emotion, an emphasis on individualism, the idealization of nature, suspicion of science and industrialization. And this is a really important kind of part of this. So as the Industrial Revolution is starting to happen and as it's gradually spreading to more and more countries, we're starting to find the, uh, the development of the big city in the modern sense of that kind of term. What intellectuals are doing, poets, artists and people generally, is they're starting to feel a little bit unnerved by this. There are some big social changes that happen over the time really of the uh, 19th century in particular. That's where we could really talk about the Romantic movement starting to have its broader social effects. So the Romantic movement I've indicated here by this rather lovely painting you can see on the left hand side. This is Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. This is actually from uh, 1880. So you're thinking there about like pre-Raphaelites, you're thinking about romanticism, you're thinking about mythology, you're thinking about the idea of the individual finding their way, climbing their way to the top of a mountain, discovering things for themselves and not being held down by the kind of social structures that, that, uh, that exist. In fact, leaving behind the emerging mercantile business, financial, material culture that the Industrial Revolution has given rise to. And over the course of the 19th century, something really interesting happens. So in Britain, which of course is the, pretty much the, the, the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, at the beginning of the 19th century, 20% uh, of people live in cities and about 80% of people live in rural situations. And by the time we reach the close of the 19th century, the figure has reversed itself. So now, we have 80% of people in Britain living in urban spaces and only 20% in rural spaces. Now, there are many reasons for this. There's a lot of kind of migration that's happening to the Americas to, um, and to Australasia and so on. But there's, it's primarily driven by work. There are big factories now where you can get work. And there's also the increasing process of people being uh, driven from the land, one might say, driven from their smaller communities as industrialization doesn't really start until we kind of get towards the uh, end of the 19th century making any kind of inroads into agriculture but certainly people have that sense that they can go to the city and they can make money and so that kind of change sets up a number of interesting things in the psyche of people and in the psyche particularly of British people because we're talking about two British authors here we're talking about uh, you know I'm, I'm from Britain I'm gonna I should say I'm in Devon by the way I think somebody else is in Devon um, uh, who's here tonight. So with this process happening in Britain, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, we start to see things like um, this book, the, the, um, this is Arthur Macken's The Great God Pan. And so um, this is published in, uh, it's, it's 1890, uh, 1894 that it's, it's released. So this is an interesting book because it points to a number of things in order for us to understand those other two texts by Dorian Valiente and P. Carroll. It points to the fact that there are magicians who are writing things. Now, that's always been the case to some extent, but Arthur Macken is a member of a thing called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which I'm guessing pretty much everybody here knows about. This kind of fin de siècle magical movement which is the uh, the crucible within which a lot of kind of contemporary magic is kind of created. So these characters like Arthur Macken and all the other kind of members of the Golden Dawn are working away there, doing their magical practice, and they're doing it in an environment which is very interesting. It's interesting, firstly, because it has women involved in it. 
Uh, so people like Pamela Coleman Smith, the designer of probably the most important uh, or, or and, uh, significant tarot deck that we have. We have people like Florence Farr, we have Annie Horniman, all of these women who are involved. And of course, the Golden Dawn could have been just like another boy's magical order, quasi Masonic for men. But simply by the expedient of including women rather wisely, they double their uh, pool of talent and they end up having an effect which is far beyond the uh, just the pure number of the people who are involved. Why the great god Pan? Well, the great god Pan, because Pan was absolutely beloved of the Victorians. The P Victorians no loved nothing more than to have a piece of ironwork with an image of Pan on it. And of course, we've got other stories that appear. We have um, published just into the 20th century, 1908, we have uh, Kenneth Graham's uh, Wind in the Willows, in which Pan appears at the Piper, as the Piper of the Gates of Dawn. Whereas in Arthur Macken's tale, Pan is much more the god of panic, the god of fear. Why are the Victorians so interested in Pan? Well, one suggestion for this is that rather like our chap standing on top of the mountain, what they feel that they have lost through industrialization is they feel they have lost their connection with wild nature. And so this desire for wild nature, this desire for this kind of romantic project of seeing, um, understanding the world in this uh, very visceral kind of a way means that Pan, who in classical mythology is a fairly, uh, well, it'd be polite to call him perhaps a B-list rather than A-list deity. Uh, some might argue C-list deity. He doesn't it doesn't play, it doesn't loom very, very large in the, 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 um, the cultural story of the ancient world. But in Victorian culture, he's big news. Part, as I said, in my opinion and in the opinion of a number of other uh, scholars, I think that this is to do with that sense of loss of the countryside. We've all moved away into these cities and we have lost our ability to stand like Friedrich's wanderer above the sea of fog in wild nature we've lost this so we need to understand this because this is the background environment the broader environment in which these magical texts start to unfold so we have to see that in this romantic process one of the things that happens is that a lot of the baddies are reimagined as the goodies so what i mean by that is um if you take this period in history and you start to look at the work of i don't know uh the brothers Grimm, for example these two german uh, academics who are um, studying folklore the idea starts to be that by looking at something like folklore you're looking at like an archaeology bear in mind this is the period of history where archaeology and, and, and geology are starting to be much more understood so the idea is that there's a, like a strata like a series of layers so you might look at a ritual or you might look at a, a folk ritual, for example, or you might look at a, a story by the Brothers Grimm and you might say, ah, what I'm reading here or what I'm seeing here, these are the attenuated echoes. These are the faint echoes of an ancient pagan past, which was before industrialization and perhaps before Christianity or maybe ran somehow in parallel to it. And of course, we've got that idea of uh, the way that the word witch starts to be changed. So lots and lots of writers are starting to experiment with the notion that the, good, the, the baddies of the past, characters that we call witches, and bear in mind that the word witch for most of its history means malefic magic user, but the romantic movement starts to re-understand the witches as rebels, uh, as uh, healers, as members of perhaps an ancient underground uh, cult, that has somehow persisted through the, the, the Christian period. So this is a time where there's a big re-evaluation kind of happening. This is the broader envelope in which we could say that 1978, the year in which these two books are published, is like a, a continuation or another eddy within that story of this reimagining of the world. Oh, here are some blokes. Right. Now, I'm not going to tell you who they are because I sort of assume that everybody knows. Um, so obviously we've got Gardner, we've got Cecil Williamson. Cecil Williamson, probably the least well-known of the three of these chaps, I guess, British screenwriter, 
film director did some very interesting kind of uh, early experiments with film um, and of course sets up the uh, witchcraft research center and the museum of witchcraft which of course persists to this day in uh, in fabulous boss castle the museum of witchcraft and magic the reason for just showing you these um, uh, three delightful humans is really just to kind of talk about briefly the, the the relationships or the some of the ideas that underlie these two texts witchcraft for tomorrow and Lieber Null. so gardner well we know his story he's there starting to release let's say uh the first material about witchcraft first through high magic's aid the the novel that he writes um and then later on through uh the subsequent texts which become more and more overt in terms of uh, pu publication about the craft and of course we know about his involvement you know, with uh, the Philip Hesselton of course is the person to go to but we know about his involvement with various groups Rosicrucian movements we know about his interest in anthropology Cecil of course he's interesting the two Guys, Cecil and Gardner, they have a collaboration. Cecil installs Gardner as the sort of witch in residence at the museum. A rather tense collaboration from what I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm given to uh, uh, understand that at one point there was a quite an altercation, shall we say, between Gardner uh, and Cecil Williamson at the museum in uh, the Isle of Man, as it would have been at the time. And then between them, we've got Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley, of course, uh, met Gardner. Um, we know that much for certain. Uh, and Crowley, of course, is um, one of those people who definitely feeds the material in textual material to the work that Gardner is doing with, let's call it the um, uh, the reimagination of what Wicca or witchcraft might be. So Crowley is actually very interested in this. And um, I just want to read you a little bit from this is this is a letter that uh, Crowley wrote to uh, writes to um, his magical son, a guy called Frater Achad, uh, Charles Stanfield Jones, who's uh, in um, in the United States, uh, and uh, he writes to him this. This is in 1915, by the way. So he's talking about a ritual that Achad has sent him, and he says, "I hope you will arrange to repeat this ritual all the time, say every new or full moon." so as to build up a regular force. You should have a solar ritual to balance it, to be done each time the sun enters a new sign, with special festivities at the equinoxes and solstices. So this is Crowley starting to say to, to, to Akkad, and he's kind of thinking aloud, he's saying, well, wouldn't it be good if there was like a sort of pagan, pagan religion, a modern pagan religion? He says, in this way, you can establish a regular cult. And if you do them in a truly magical manner, you'll create a vortex of force, which will suck in all the people that you want. The time is just right, writes uh, Crowley, for a natural religion. People like rites and ceremonies, they're tired of hypothetical gods. So fairly early on in the game, Crowley is exploring this idea of having a kind of uh, a magical uh, cultus, a magical um, pagan religion. And these three guys really their their work is the bedrock upon which these books will be founded so there's dorian himself so dorian valiente again i'm not going to re rehash all the stuff you know, the wikipedia entry is, is is fairly fairly uh, comprehensive and i imagine most people here are familiar with her work some people may maybe uh i know you know friends I unfortunately never had the opportunity to meet Dorian, though I would have dearly loved to have done so. I've put some two images here. One image over on the left hand side, which is an image of a kind of ceremonial magic temple. OK. The kind of thing that the Golden Dawn would have been really familiar with. Ceremonial magic, the, the, the sort of style that we have from lineages like um, W.B. Gray and we have people like um, uh, Dion Fortune and so on. And then we've got a Morris dancing side, Morris dancing team. And Doreen, for me, in a way, sits kind of between these two worlds. Because Wicca, witchcraft, the style of which she was engaging with, working with Gardner, being initiated by him and so on, obviously draws a lot of its material from ceremonial magic. A lot of um, the, the ritual structure, the initiations and so on have their roots in 
the Western ceremonial tradition. But there's also this kind of folkishness about witchcraft, and that's why the Morris side are there. So there's a sense in which this is perhaps the, uh, the high church version of magic with the ceremonial stuff, but this is also that kind of rootsy, earthy, gutsy kind of feel about there being um, these ancient roots to the magic that's being done by witches and that those ancient roots can be seen in modern folk celebrations. And if we look at that image of Doreen herself, she's she's kind of doing the sort of stuff that we would we would expect. We've got you know we've got a, 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 a book of shadows, magical text there. She's holding up a, a bell and a, and, a, and a magic knife. And so she sits at this kind of point of intersection: ceremonial magic on the one side, and the idea of this folk tradition of magic on the other. And of course, we know that there is a rich and vibrant folk tradition that's variously referred to now as the tradition of um, uh, service magicians, sometimes people call them, or cunning folk after the work of Owen Davis. We know that there is this great magical tradition that does exist, but most of this exists within a, a Christian framework. You know, most of the people who are doing wart charming in the 17th century would identify themselves probably very clearly as Christians, but they are doing something that is magical and is just on the edge of what the church would consider acceptable kind of at the time. So into this kind of, we've got this kind of heady mix that's happening. Now the other text is the text that emerges from a slightly different flavor of magic. It emerges at, and into, um, from the hermetic tradition and describes itself later on, not in its first publication in 1978, as chaos magic. So here's a little quote from Peter J. Carroll. And you can sort of see where this is coming from. This is a magic which embraces uh, modern uh, contemporary psychology, um, but also is quite happy to lift phraseology and ideas from other cultural settings, notably the uh, alleged words of Hassan Isabar, um, uh, with nothing is true and everything is permitted. So he says, in chaos magic, beliefs are not seen as ends in themselves, but as tools for creating desired effects. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a magic which situates itself as a kind of postmodern magic. So the belief is not seen as true. It's seen as some, something which is um, entered into in order to make some kind of effect, but as tools for creating desired effects. To fully realise this is to face a terrible freedom in which nothing is true and everything is permitted. Nothing is absolutely true. Everything may prove possible is how Pete likes to Pete Carroll likes to put it these days, which is to say that everything is possible. There can be no certainties and the consequences can be ghastly. Um, incidentally, that's not a picture of Pete Carroll. Uh, that's a picture of Ray Sherwin, uh, who was uh, he was working with at, at the time. And we can see that image of this eight pointed star, which is lifted from uh, the work of Michael Moorcock. Uh, and influenced by uh, the uh, alignment system from a thing called a, uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So as Wicca is looking towards a folk tradition for its validation, so Chaos Magic is in a sense more punk, I suppose. It's trying to break these things down and it's trying to be postmodern and it's trying to use contemporary culture or reimagine things in very, very different and novel ways. So these are the two strands we're gonna follow as we look through these texts. What do we find with Witchcraft for Tomorrow? Okay, so what do we, what do we get here? What's actually the, 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 um, the substance of our text? Well, the first thing is, this is published by Hale. So it's published by a major publisher, major esoteric publisher of the time, um, producing lots and lots of uh, esoteric books and continue to do so to this day under slightly different imprint names. And let's have a look at, uh, there's a photograph of Doreen uh, over on the left hand side and some images of, uh, again, photographs of our author um, over on the right from the book. Again, we can see this idea of a kind of folk tradition, the idea of using a cauldron, the idea of using a broomstick, the idea of deploying what is the most, the largest crystal ball I think I've ever seen uh, used in peacetime. Um, the book itself, is divided into various sections 
Um, and as Marco mentioned, the Book of Shadows uh, that uh, um, Doreen produces actually makes up a relatively small section towards the end of the text. So what's the rest of the text about? Well, the rest of the text con contains things like sections on divination, the magic circle, signs and symbols, which festivals and so on. But essentially what it is, is it's an interesting um, mixture of uh, ceremonial magic, um, mythology, ethnography, and folk magic. And what it's trying to do in some respects is it's trying to create uh, a validation for the bit that comes later. So Doreen produces the Book of Shadows and says, hey, you can go ahead and do this. But the vast majority of the book is the establishment of the kind of the lineage and the importance of this. In fact, it's interesting because there's a section here, uh, I've got page 14, where she writes, it's been stated that Francis King and his ritual magic in England, that Alistair Crowley was paid by Gerald Gardner to write the rituals of Gardner's new witch cult. And this statement has re been repeated without question by those various other writers. It seems to me, however, highly questionable. The basic rituals of the, quotes, Gardnerian witch cult were published in the form of fiction in the novel High Magic's Aid. Uh, she says, um, now Gerald Gardner uh, never met Alistair Crowley until the very last years of the latter's life, when he was a feeble old man living in a private hotel in Hastings, being kept alive by injections of drugs. So not a very flattering picture and one that's perhaps a little dismissive and I wonder whether or not it's dismissive because consciously or unconsciously, Doreen would have recognized some of Crowley's poetry in the Wiccan rituals that she was being given by Gardner. The other thing, of course, about that statement uh, that Doreen makes is that towards the end of his life, Alistair Crowley wrote a thing called the Book of Thoth and produced the Thoth tarot deck, um, which I don't know, you know, this was, um, uh, completed a, a couple of years before he died in 47. So even towards the end of his life, this is a very, very productive uh, individual. Whether or not he was paid to write the rituals, that seems like, a, I think, as far as I understand it, fairly unlikely, but the, that he had a very important influence on the ritual structure, I think is, un, is, is, is hard to deny. So what Doreen's book does is she uses the first sections to create an evocation of witchcraft, particularly an evocation of witchcraft, which the romantics would have been very happy with. She opens the book itself with uh, that the beautiful poem, which I won't read the whole of it, but just a, the witch's ballad. Oh, I have been beyond the town where nightshades black and mandrake grow. And I have heard and I have seen what righteous folk would fear to know, for I have heard at still midnight, upon the hilltop far forlorn, with note that echoed through the dark, the winding of the heathen horn. And I have seen the fire aglow and glinting from the magic sword, and with the inner eye beheld the horned one, the Sabbath Lord. So a lovely evocative kind of beginning. This is how the book begins. The book begins by saying, I, this lone individual on top of the mountain, rather like Caspar Friedrich, he, we, I've gone away from these, from the town, from the industrial world, and I've gone beyond the town. I've gone to this place where nightshades black and mandrake grow, these magical, mysterious uh, herbs, and I have heard what righteous folk would fear to know. So again, there's that kind of individualism, there's that desire to set out on the spiritual quest for oneself. The note that echoes through the dark. So this kind of suggests that you're joining this community. There are other people up on top of that hill and you too can join them. And you can join them in part by fast forwarding to the end of the book and looking at the Book of Shadows. So the Book of Shadows is really interesting. Um, it is not the standard issue Wiccan Gardnerian rituals that Doreen would have been familiar with at the time. It is in some respects a simplified, pared down uh, version of that, a very accessible version of that not pared down in a way that renders it um, uh, without its potency, without its, without its um, uh, beautiful quality, but pared down in the sense that it's much simpler to apply. The words in common with lots of Dorian's practice are often done poetically and with rhyming meter, so they're easy to remember. There are 
descriptions of the casting of the circle, self-initiation rites, consecration. She puts an image of a pentacle that you might choose to use. Interestingly, she subtly amends the pentacle from the Wiccan version, which has a uh, typically has a S symbol for kiss and an S with a line through it, rather like a dollar sign for scourge. So she changes that. So there are now two S's in mirror to each other. And she refers to that in the text as being the twin serpents, of Kajikeus, or the twin energies, yin and yang. So she's creating a form of witchcraft, which is very highly accessible for people. And she also includes information for founding a coven and for initiation rites, as well as, of course, including things like spellcraft and including magical writing, magical scripts that could be used. Uh, the runes of Andre uh, is an example of a, the, a magical script that she gives in that particular part of the text. So that's what Dorian's doing in her book. Let's have another look at another thing from 1978. Let's have another look at, uh, oh, here's Lieber Null. So Lieber Null these days is usually bound with its companion volume, um, Psychonaut. Psychonaut was published a little bit later in 1982. But in Lieber Null, we have a diagram that greets us as we open the book. And it's the diagram over there on the left hand side. This is doing in a much shorter form exactly what Doreen spends a lot of her time doing in the first part of her book. And it's basically saying, where does the authority for this text come from? Who are the people who are validating that this is like true, proper magic? And the answer, it would seem to be, according to uh, uh, Peter J. Carroll, that we can see this delightful flow diagram, which includes basically everyone you've ever thought of who's a bit magic, uh, pointing at IOT. So the magical pact of the Illuminates of Thanateros, the magical order which um, Pete, Ray Sherwin and others founded. Although what's interesting about Libanol is that it's the uh, training text of an order that doesn't really exist yet. So the magical pact itself, the, the IOT, um, it really kind of kicks off uh, and, uh, kind of officially in the, mm, the, the 80s, really. But in, the ni in 1976, 79, Ray Sherwin, uh, and Pete Carroll are, uh, running, uh, operating a magazine called The New Equinox. And it's The New Equinox in which they're kind of kicking around these ideas. One of the ideas that they're interested in is they want to find a form of magic which manages to escape from the kind of theocracy, the kind of um, the idea that you have to have a magical religion, which is what Wicca is kind of understood or is, is explaining itself to be at this point in history. So we have the magical duo theology of the god and the goddess. We have ethics um, in terms of the Wiccan read and so forth. We also have that ceremonial magic strand that's represented by people like uh, Dion Fortune and later Dolores Ashcroft in the wiki. Um, and we have Alistair Crowley's uh, um, style of magic of Thelema. And what Carol wants to do is he wants to say, I don't want any religiosity. I want a technique which is, or an approach to magic, which has this um, scientific bent. Now, part of the reason for that is quite simple. It's that Pete Carroll is a chemist by trade. Um, but a chemist who's, who's certainly somebody who's not without their ability to evoke a mood in much the same way that Doreen spends time evoking the mood of her witchcraft um, in... Carroll does exactly the same thing in Lieber Null. There we have in the centre, um, an image based around the kind of um, figures of uh, the, the, the script of Austin Osman Spare, who is one of the significant kind of influences on what later becomes known as chaos magic. In fact, the word chaos magic doesn't appear in Libanol, and not in the first versions anyway. So Austin Osman Spare, um, the famous uh, British uh, artist and sorcerer, um, and you can see his technique being used over there on the right hand side with sigilization, the creation of a magical glyph. Doreen has very, very kind of similar things um, in her book. You know, this is unsurprising. This is the same magical technology. Um, one might suggest that the assumed morality or perhaps deliberate punk-like lack of it uh, that Pete Carroll is demonstrating by the intention of the three signs that he, uh, the three magical spells that he wants to weave. Um, the first one, he wants to get a copy of the Necronomicon I mean, frankly, who doesn't? Uh, that's the first one there. Then he has a pictorial method to create the sigil to restrain 
an adversary. So uh, that's good. And then his mantric spell, the chanted spell that he shows at the bottom uh, right hand side is uh, for him to meet a succubus in a dream. These are possibly all things that an excitable young sorcerer would like to do. Um, and so we have to, you know, we have to think about when these people write these texts in terms of their own story and their own kind of practice as well. So Lieber Null, beyond that diagram over on the left hand side is curiously ahistoric. So there's pretty much nowhere in Lieber Null where, Crow, where, where um, Pete Carroll says, oh, this is from Alistair Crowley, by the way, or, oh, this idea is from the Abramelin uh, grimoire. The post-modernity, one might say, the ahistory, uh, ahistorical nature of the text, and one might say in a, a slightly less generous way, the inability to cite one's sources, which Doreen does extensively. She gives really lots of kind of, you know, there's a there's there's um, very, very long bibliography in her book. Um, and there are lots of kind of notes and references. So P. Carroll kind of dispenses with that and says, well, none of this is important. And he writes this text as a kind of didactic training text for an order, which is only just starting to, to come into reality. I suppose in some respects that's a really good act of magic because the order comes into reality and persists to this day. So these two texts, their influence, their 44 years worth of publication, bear in mind that almost everybody who's going to be writing a magical book, if they're writing within the field of magic, witchcraft, they will very likely have encountered these texts. So what, what, what do these texts kind of lead us up to? Well, they lead us up to, um, in many respects, the acceptance of uh, paganism for starters. Um, the, the work of reimagining words like witch and words like pagan, which was started by the Romantic movement, is really made kind of quite uh, solid in the form of the books uh, Lieber Null and Witchcraft for Tomorrow. And as we wind through the latter part of the 20th century, organisations like the Pagan Federation in Britain and many others elsewhere across the world are working to, to um, in a way to allow the acceptance and understanding of these belief systems so that now we can quite cheerfully post a meme like this. Um, and it's, it's just funny and throwaway and entertaining. And whilst we should, of course, always remember that religious prejudice can always uh, rear its ugly head and it's not simply that the job is done, it's as a continuous practice. We are in a fortunate situation, certainly um, in the British Isles, where if I'm admitted to a hospital and I write pagan as my religion on the form, no one really bats an eyelid. In fact, probably one of the nurses or one of the doctors says, oh, actually, I've got a friend, meaning that they already are a pagan. But Nevertheless, we have this acceptance. That's one of the things that's kind of really that grows out of these books. And it grows out of these books because they deploy an accessible technology of magic. And if you have a lineage only, initiatory only style of magic, it tends to be that that only works for a very small number of people. So by producing Her Book of Shadows and by producing Lieber Null, by publishing these texts, um, Libanol becomes more widely published in the, uh, the early 80s. We find ourselves at, in a time when a young person, um, or indeed an older person who finds themselves fascinated by these things, can easily reach for a book or more likely for the internet. This is where we are now. So the Venice Biennale this year um, has a big exhibition on surrealism and particular female surrealists and the occult. This is a big change. If you were to go and want to talk uh, in, uh, to uh, an academic audience uh, about uh, art uh, 10 years ago, uh, and certainly 20 years ago, and you wanted to mention that some artists quite liked magic, it would have been considered nah, just a bit weird, a bit sort of outré, even for the art world which is rather strange given that there are so many uh, artists who are influenced by this uh, aspect of human experience. But now there are conferences and there are indeed world-leading exhibitions that bring these things together and showcase them. 
And because those books exist, because these techniques are made accessible and this language is spread around, the general background cultural story in many parts of the Euro-American world is such that people go, oh, it's an occult thing. Oh, I see. That's quite interesting. There's a conference in, uh, in Northampton, Trans States. Um, if you're able to make it, I'm going to be speaking there. Myself and my partner, Nikki, Nikki Weird. This is the second, uh, I think second, yeah, second conference um, on this theme. And this is bringing together uh, academics who are interested in the occult, which there are an increasing number, and artists and esoteric practitioners. So that 45 best which podcasts, I mean, I don't know which ones they actually are, but I'm sure they're all fabulous. Um, and the Encyclopedia Britannica entry on Wicca, Wicca, religion, Wicca, predominantly a Western movement, blah, 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 off it goes. Very, very kind of acceptable to most people who would identify as Wiccan. They would look at this and say, actually, yeah, no, this is pretty much, pretty much accurate. There, of course, have been lots of changes that have allowed this thing to happen, including things that have happened really deep within the culture of magic uh, and specifically within witchcraft. And one of the recognitions of that, one of the changes, is the recognition of this kind of romantic process of reimagining. So Doreen, in her book, Witchcraft for Tomorrow, uses in many places the term the old religion. She refers to Gardner as old Gerald. So there's this sense of like, age and the history and the folk tradition and so on and i think that although um we might say that wicca itself is a relatively new form of magic a relatively new form of religiosity we can at the same time say that there is a lineage there is a connection to all of those other kinds of magical culture both the uh, folk tradition and also within the um, ceremonial magic but few people, I think, these days believe what has been called the witch cult hypothesis, the Murrayite hypothesis, the kind of hypothesis that really witchcraft for tomorrow is still working within. So Dorian's book is still embedded within this idea that there is this ancient witch cult and that Margaret Murray and uh, perhaps Gardner's suggestions of contact with uh, other witches is, uh, is, is to be taken purely at face value rather than as a piece of what we might kindly and generously call a piece of poetic truth as opposed to literal truth. Gosh, where are we for time? 20 minutes apart. Okay, nearly there. Where's it going to go next? Okay, so magic is now um, open source. Witchcraft is now open source. Um, Doreen's book, of course, is published a couple of years before um, Eight Sabbaths for Witches, and then a few years later, we have The Witch's Way by Janet and Stuart Farrow. So Wicca, becomes this global movement, becomes this access accessible form of magic, and of course goes into lots and lots of proliferations. Chaos magic persists and again goes into lots and lots of different um, uh, cultures and communities of which the IoT is one, but by no means the only one. Where's this going to go next? Well, perhaps one of the things that the both of these books touch upon, but don't really engage with very deeply, is the point that we looked at back in 1978 of all of those cars at the gas station in the United States. And that's that we know, we know, all of us know, we're at a point on our planet where there's some tricky things happening. And um, that 10 of swords card, um, which is a, a rather beautiful illustration from Lisa Stirl's The Modern Witch's Tarot, that's where we are now. So magic, I would suggest its next challenge is going to be to address even more directly how we do magic in a world which is poisoned and dying. Now, some people have attempted to do this. Um, I think that uh, Apocalyptic Witchcraft by Peter Gray is a, is a, is a good, a good uh, um, way of approaching this. But there will be many other kind of ways of understanding this. And also, we know that we've had plenty of forms of paganism, forms of magical work, which have been directly engaged with political action. And I suspect that we will see more and more of this, simply as the situation, as regards the biosphere, as regards inequality, as regards the kinds of conflicts that we see emerging in the world, 
that political magic will become even more important as we go through into the 21st, uh, later into the 21st century. Now, I don't mean to be giving you guys a downer. I would say that even when it's dark and rather forbidding, things can get better. Lisa Stirl's um, rather beautiful image of someone texting everything is fine uh, during their Ten of Swords experience. Uh, she, pa she painted this picture and then uh, put it onto social media and a couple of her friends said, oh, this is amazing. She was a, a struggling artist at the time um, and not doing so well. And her friend said, well, why don't you do a whole tarot? And so she did. And she's now the, um, the Modern Witch's Tarot is one of the, uh, the, uh, the best selling decks, certainly at the moment. So even when things look tricky, there are possibilities. There is magic in the world and there is transformation that is possible. Quick little plug for some books. Chaos Craft is something that I wrote with uh, um, my friend Steve D a few years back. That documents basically bringing together Wiccan ideas of the, particularly the um, eight festivals and the approaches of chaos magic, both uh, conveniently um, eight pointed wheels or eight spoked wheels. Um, and so that was our attempt to kind of bring these things together a which is mirrored by Lavana Morgan. Lavana has a, a Gardnerian sort of heritage and her form of witchcraft in a way is resonant very strongly with Doreen's, but also one of those uh, approaches which is uh, particularly uh, ad uh, adapted to working in a solitary way and also working outside. And then um, Kirsten Solier's book, Witch Hunt, which if you haven't read it, I really recommend. This is a very, very good up-to-date kind of like modern witch's book because it's a travelogue essentially it's a, it's her tale of traveling around various places that are associated with witchcraft and if you want a really nice introduction to where which how witchcraft is being thought of i think by kind of more contemporary audiences i think that's a very very good place to to look there's another really rather lovely image by uh, lisa Stirl. and so just to kind of close on this both of these books, Witchcraft of Tomorrow by Dorian Valiente, Peter J. Carroll's Lieber Null, why are they significant? They're significant because they reveal the secret. They reveal the secret that magic is best done by taking up a wand, by casting a circle and by doing it for yourself in tune with the romantic tradition where we strike out on our own to discover our own spiritual understandings and where we want to become our own magicians. These books are very much part of that story. And I would suggest that they are really vital staging points on opening up magic so that it can be shared, so that it can be taught, that it can be understood and explored, and that perhaps it could come to our aid when we need it most. And we're done. Thank you very, very much to Julian Vane. Thank you very much for this very enlightening uh, lecture uh, uh, about, I would say, the contextualization of not only Wicca, but many other traditions, really. Um, if you allow us, um, we, uh, we already received a few questions. So would you have the kindness to answer? I, I would be very happy to, Marco. Thank you. So I'll uh, read um, the first one from Heli. Uh, I hope I pronounced that well. I apologize in advance for all my mispronunciations, as I always do. So a few slides back, you showed a book page with photos of Doreen on uh, them and, and re you read a poem. W what was the book called, please? OK, so the, for extra points, the book is called Witchcraft for Tomorrow. There's the, there's the thing. So these are, this is, these are the two texts. If you haven't read them, please, please rush out and get them. Uh, like I say, they're, they're, they're in print and I know that it pays for Pete Carroll's sandwiches of a lunchtime. So, um, yeah. That's where all of that stuff is. So um, all the images that you suggest to us, they all come from uh, that publication. Uh, uh, from Simon, 
uh, oh, wow, I won't pronounce that correctly. Paul Firebend? No? Okay. <laughs> the anarchist philosopher of science published Against Method in 1975 with its slogan, Anything Goes. When Pete Carroll is thinking of himself as a punk uh, scientist, would he have been aware of this book, do we think? Um, that's a really good question. I think the short answer is probably no, because I remember having a conversation with Pete Carroll about postmodernity, and he was um, less familiar with a lot of the ideas than you might imagine. You know, one of the things I think that happens with um, uh, with writers is that they they don't necessarily notice what their influences are. You know, none of us. You know, we, we're all picking stuff up from culture all the kind of all the time. Um, so I don't think Pete was actually very familiar with postmodernity, and and I, I think that the idea of um, this kind of anything goes thing, I think that the the idea of um, postmodern philosophy was kind of starting to be in the air. But I think that actually the thing that drove Pete really in terms of the kind of iconoclastic style was the fact that um, uh, he wanted to create something that was not the OTO. It was not Ordo Templi Orientis, and it was not Wicca. And at the time, the two big contenders in town were, you know, if you wanted to, if you were interested in magic, that's what you, you, you either had to join one or the other, basically. Some people join both, of course. You know, I find, found myself joining Wicca. It was accessible. It was, you know, in the media. There were people that I could go and meet and I could kind of get involved in, in, in that. Um, so I think what Pete is trying to do is he's trying to just uh, be iconoclastic and breaking away from things in that kind of a sense. So I don't think he would have been necessarily um, familiar with against method. Um, in some respects, actually, the way that, pa that chaos magic has emerged, it's become a lot more discordian, so a lot more playful than I think Pete has in the book. I mean, you know, Pete's, Pete's style of writing is quite, um, it's quite austere. And uh, and and, uh, and uh, one might suggest a little bombastic on occasion. Um, so the idea of this sort of um, those those kind of like deeply radical ideas, I don't think he would have necessarily been been in touch with those. But I mean, you know, it's a good it's that's certainly a good question. Thank you for that, Simon. Um, and from Paige, we we've got a question: How would you connect the reclaiming tradition? to the historical chart. We're, we're talking about, I think we're talking about uh, Starok and, and the environment in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So in terms of that chart that I showed you, that chart is from Liber Null. Mm -hmm. So the chart, because it's from Liber Null, um, it doesn't really kind of touch on any of um, those, those, those other um, uh, radical kind of political traditions. If we're talking about how these books generally relate to those things, um, I think that the uh, the work of people like Starhawk and so on is a, it historically is a little later. So I think that what we're talking about is we're talking about a situation where this sets up the conditions for people to know how to do magic. And then activist magicians come along like Starhawk or activist witches like Starhawk. And they realize that actually a lot of these ritual techniques can be used in demonstration. They can be used in um, uh, uh, exercises to create group cohesion. For, uh, for political activity. So I think that that's kind of a little bit later on in the story. If we'd have, if we'd have, um, uh, I, I mentioned this whole thing about the, the environmental issue, which is the kind of the big one at the moment, I think, in terms of, particularly if you're gonna have an earth-based spirituality, how could you not be interested in this? So all of that tradition from um, reclaiming things like, um, I remember back in the latter part of the 20th century, there was a thing called the Dragon Environmental Network, and there was a whole series of magical work uh, to do with uh, a, an ancient woodland near London or in London called Oxley's Woods. And, and lots and lots of different uh, groups were involved in that, including members of the IOT. So I think that the reclaiming tradition and that kind of radical political magic unfolds from the ability that both of these authors had to kind of give the techniques to people, to say, this is what you can do, do this for yourselves. That itself is a radical act, and then it creates the background for further radicalism. We've got a question from Senia. Uh, thank you very much, wonderful talk. Um, thanks to these authors for laying a foundation to make magic accessible. Because I think if times are tough and people struggle, 
there is a big need for magic as a self-help. So better make it accessible for those in need. I like the pun comp uh, comparison to and can relate uh, very much to it. So it, well, it was a comment, but a very nice one. So I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna return to that if I may. I mean, I I actually teach um, a national health service, so um, the British Health Service. I teach well-being stuff, and when I teach well-being stuff, so meditation practices, physical practices, and so on. I am basically teaching magical techniques, things that I learned as magical techniques. And I'm changing the vocabulary, changing the language so that these techniques are accessible to other people. You know, if you think if we always talk about, you know, pranayama and breath work and, you know, breathing in the good stuff, breathing out the difficult stuff, whatever it is. Now, that technique is a fundamental um, uh, process, which, which, you know, anyone can do. There's no necessity to have any lineage or a magic circle or anything like this. So, yeah, the, the accessibility of this stuff. I mean, a lot of my work in a variety of uh, d domains is about accessibility. And I think that by giving people this stuff, um, that's that's really helpful. The difficulty that we face now, particularly with so much material on the Internet, is how do we sort? How do we search? How do we triangulate and triage our information so that we can be reasonably happy that we're getting good quality stuff? That's another problem. But it's very different from the problem that I faced um, as a young man uh, in the 1970s, where there were very, very few books on the bookshelf at all. Uh, I think uh, your answer, Julian, here relates very well to a second comment by Xenia that says that effectively we, we need all these books and courses on magical activism at the moment. It, it, it really means that the world and the people uh, need this. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Sharon. Do Eresians fit into the chaos tradition in any direct way? I mean, the, the short answer is yes. I mean, uh, um, hail Discordia. Um, so Eris, the, 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 the goddess of uh, discord, um, plays a fabulous role um, uh, by rolling a golden apple um, at a, a particularly delicious moment uh, in the, um, the ancient mythology. Um, does she play a role? Yes. I mean, there is another text, um, which is Principia Discordia, uh, or How I Found the Goddess and What I Did to Her When I Found Her, which is which predates Liber Null and is part of the American, particularly the American tradition, uh, North, North American tradition of kind of contemporary crazy wisdom. So, you know, there are characters in there like um, um, Shri Baba Bebop and, you know, these these sorts of it's, it's very humorous. It's that kind of if you think of the spaghetti monster and pastafarianism and all these kinds of things, then yes, that's absolutely there. Um, this, in my experience, emerged strongly within the Magical Pact, the Illuminates of Thanateros, the IOT. Um, it's less evident within uh, Liber Null, um, but there is definitely a kind of playful aspect of it. There's a bit where, in the, in the book where uh, Carol suggests the idea of a random belief, so basically taking a dice giving each side of the dice a belief like monotheism, pantheism, you know, Marxism, whatever. And you just roll the dice and then you try and be into that belief system for a week or so. So there is a kind of a playful discordian kind of quality to it. And it comes through much, much later, I think, in the kind of chaos uh, current. Um, but yes, there is definitely a direct relationship between those things. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. We've got another question from Evan. Uh, in what ways do you think current popular expressions of chaos magic has become religious or dogmatic in contrast to the intentions of the original movement? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. It, I mean, inevitably, any group of human beings, if they want consist, if they want uh, to, to, to create a culture, what a culture consists of is um, a, an agreed on set of signs and symbols, you know, language, what various things sort of mean. Uh, as hand gestures, uh, iconography. And so inevitably, something like chaos magic, although it might start off as a very kind of iconoclastic, postmodern system, fairly early on in the game, it has its symbol. This is the symbol of chaos magic, you know, the eight pointed star. So inevitably that kind of happens. Does it become religious? I, I don't know if it, I don't know if it necessarily does. Um, and I think that the reason it doesn't is because really within chaos magic, there's this idea that 
um, all truth and all ideas are partial and provisional. So the, uh, the notion is that even if I find myself regularly working with a deity or with a particular magical system and so on, I recognize that that's only part of the story. And what tends to happen with religious movements by and large, although not in every context, is they tend to start claiming that they know the answer, that they have the way, the truth and the light. And that tends to be where those kind of divisions start, start forming and the tensions form. Um, if nothing else, very soon within any kind of religious culture, you'll have a, a, a strong schism. And although there are many chaos magicians who are not members of the IoT, the vast majority of them are not members of the IoT, um, I think that there is a sense in which perhaps the system tends to uh, facilitate its own deconstruction. Now, the only problem with this is that postmodernity is not the last word in philosophy and metamodernism, which is basically the idea of agreeing that there are multiple views of stuff, but also realizing that fundamentally you do have to choose something because even if you don't choose anything, that's still a choice. So I think that there's kind of other work that's being done. There's a book actually just come out uh, again by my lovely friend, Steve D, which is called Chaos Monk. And that's looking at the techniques of monasticism and the techniques of um, uh, the sort of, yeah, basically kind of monk style. Like what would that mean in a chaos magic context? You know, so places, uh, processes like pilgrimage, places like solitary, uh, processes like solitary retreat and so on. And if you read the forward of this, the forward of that book, which is written by the current section head, the current head of the um, British IOT, one of the things he says in it is he says that one of the difficulties with chaos magic, particularly as presented by Lieber Null, is it's very technocratic. It's like, hey, there's just this force in the universe and we can do whatever we want with it. And the problem with that is that um, ethics and, and, and um, uh, our kind of choices about the world are still real things. And so we will inevitably make these kinds of choices. So the forward that's been written for Steve's book is basically the, the, the current head of the IOT uh, in Britain saying, this is really nice because this is a return to the, the um, what you could think of as a, a mysticism. Um, so a kind of transcendental sense of like a union with the divine which in some respects one might argue is the whole of the romantic project you know the whole of the magical project what's our dude doing up on top of those mountains well he's trying to seek a union with the divine in the form of the mountains in the form of the solitude in the form of his own desire to climb the mountain so i think that there is a development of the of, uh, of chaos magic which is starting to include more and more this kind of um mystical or transcendent uh, element, but not necessarily with the kinds of structures of religiosity, because all of those truths are provisional. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. So we, we cannot know the totality. We cannot claim that uh, we've got the answer. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, <clears throat> I can see we've got many signs of appreciations, uh, not um, any other questions. Um, Senia appreciates the teaching of magical techniques <laughs> under a different name. I think uh, all of us who are involved in some sort of education, uh, they, they try that at least once. <laughs> I did, <laughs> teaching archaeology. Um, any other questions within the chat? <clears throat> if not, I've got a small one that I was thinking about. Me being me and being very um, ignorant, uh, I would like to ask, and I think, I think I've got the answer. I think you already sort of gave me the idea of an answer, but um, in, in Wicca, uh, this, this text, Wicca for Tomorrow, I would argue it was quite uh, revolutionary because including the Liberum Brarum, um, obviously made Wicca very accessible and Wicca was not very accessible uh, mm. back then. Being Wicca a mysteric initiatory religion uh, in, its, in its origin, in its, in its essence. So um, of, of course, uh, Doreen didn't really reveal anything or, or broke any oaths because 
if if there are any initiators here, uh, they, you you will all know, you will all recognize that these are not exactly the same things that you find in a in a Wiccan book of shadow. However, I wonder um, how chaos magic relates to lineages and this sort of 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 structures. Are, are they kept in any consideration or chaos magic actually supports a sort of um, you know, uh, um, going beyond these superstructures. I mean, I just 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 to um, emphasise that point that you made there, Marco. That yeah, the, the the book of shadows that Doreen produces in here is very radical, and I actually I suspect, and I've not done a kind of close enough read of this or, or enough research to really uh, be able to demonstrate this, but I I wonder about this because. Um, when Janet Stewart Farrah produce Eight Sabbaths of Witches and the Witches Away, which do disclose the, the material that, you know, we've all been diligently copying down in our books from the coven. Um, one of the things that's interesting about that is that the rituals they produce are, uh, that it is much more kind of ceremonial magic because Wicca has this kind of strong ceremonial magic element. And a lot of it is not very good for doing outside, for example. I mean, if you've ever tried to do your salt your water, do that outside, get all the cat. I mean, it's not, it's not adapted for it, right? It's not adapted for it. But the interesting thing about Doreen's stuff is it's much more accessible for that. And in a way, it's much more like some of the witchcraft that we see now that you can see on, you know, hashtag witches of Instagram. And I wonder whether or not people kind of looked at Eight Sabbaths of Witches and thought, well, you know, I haven't got all this bling and I haven't got all this stuff and I haven't got like another eight mates who can do this thing with me. Now, if they'd had a copy, as indeed I did, of Witchcraft for Tomorrow, they might have decided to adapt something from that, maybe informed by the Farrah's work. But, um, you know, I know that as a young man, that's exactly what I did. And I suspect that I'm not alone in doing that kind of work. Now, as far as the lineage thing is concerned, I mean, I often joke that, you know, Witchcraft, Wicca, with its lineages that go all the way back to, oh, I don't know, 1950, let's, let's say. You know, I mean, what does what does any of this matter? It matters in the sense that we need to have a sense of authority. That much is clear because Doreen uses a lot of her book to talk about this. And Pete certainly introduces the first part of his book and says, here's the flow diagram. Here's us. Now here's the rest. So lineage and authority is seen as being very important. Um, I think that probably as we go, you know, where we are now with the thing is that um, Lineage is probably of less significance by and large, except in as much as um, if we have someone who's a good teacher, we might say, oh, I was taught by so-and-so, or I worked with so-and-so, or I've hung out with these people, or I've done this kind of stuff. Your introduction that you read to me earlier on is basically a list of the people I've hung out with who, are, who, who, who were cool. You know, so I've done d doing rituals with Dave the Bard. I think Dave the Bard's cool. So I say, you know, Druidry, right, that's a thing. You know, so I think that actually it's it's getting closer to more like um what would be the equivalent. It's less about like the 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 um the uh, the the direct sort of lineage with the thing, and it's more about the cultural location of where you are. You know, how, how long have you been doing this sort of stuff? How many different flavors have you encountered? Have you gone really deep into one particular style? So within chaos magic, you know, there are, I mean, there are now hereditary chaos magicians rather amusingly. So there are people who are members of the IOT who when their kids got to 23, which is the age we have as an, you know, you can't enter it before, before that age, they joined. So, you know, but those people are not, any more significant than anyone else, you know? And certainly there would be little or no time spent wondering about how many clicks we are from some person in the relatively recent past. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very exhaustive as, a, as an answer. Thank you so much. Um, I am aware of the time. Uh, I, uh, I think we should draw at an end, I can see, uh, if you can also look at the chat, I can see a lot of lovely messages um, uh, and greetings and, and, and thanks to our speaker, to Julian. Um, before to close the night, uh, I would just like to remind you uh, that tonight you uh, obviously contributed to support our work. 
um, in this moment, just to say a few words, in this moment we are actively working on our collection, meaning that we are bringing the collection, all the artifacts, um, in terms of conservation up to the spectrum standards, which is the recognized uh, British standard for um, uh, approved by the Museum Association. And we are preparing the collection for its permanent display, uh, which will happen very soon. We cannot say when, we cannot say how, we cannot say where, but um, it will happen. So th for all of this, we need, we need uh, your support and you did it tonight. Once again, uh, from Yule, uh, we will start uh, to include in our uh, series of lecture, uh, some lectures on uh, our categories of artifacts. Uh, if you can all unmute yourself for a moment, I think we should all uh, give a round of applause to Julian tonight. Oh, thank you very, very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the Centre for Pagan Studies, Doreen Valiente Foundation. Really appreciate it. Julie, Marcos, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stop the recording now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't think we need this anymore. Let's see. Stop.